Today on CityCast Philly, it's the Friday News Roundup. We're talking about the increase in overdose deaths in Philly, how Penn's Nobel Prize winning scientists made the university a ton of money, and what we can expect next from the Phillies in their postseason run. It's Friday, October 7th. I'm Laura Benshoff, filling in for Trinae Nari, and here's what Philly's talking about. Marco Serino, you cover health at the Philadelphia Tribune. Thank you so much for being here. Hey, thanks for having me on. I'm, I'm very excited to talk about what came out early, earlier this week from the health department. Great. And we have Abraham Gutman, health reporter at the Philadelphia Inquirer as well. Good morning. Good morning. Go Phils. <laughs> Go Phils. And speaking of Go Phils, OJ Spivey, sports and culture writer for the Philadelphia Tribune. Great to have you back on as well. Good morning, Laura. Great time to be a Philadelphia sports fan. Amen. All right. Before we get into the show, we're going to have a little bit of an icebreaker. So earlier this week, our host, Trinae Nuri, sat down with the Inquirer's Beatrice Foreman, and they had this lovely conversation about the best diners in Philly, this sort of almost dying out form of, of eating out, you know, the old vinyl benches and counter seating and cheap coffee and tuna melts and, you know, that whole kind of like diner world that's Uh, Still hanging on in Philly, but maybe not as much of a part of our going out scene as it used to be. So I wanted to ask y'all, what is your go-to diner in the city? Do you have one that you really like? One that I used to go to, and I think that's still around, is uh, Andy's Diner. And I know they were at Concha Hocken. Mm. So that was one of the classic diners that that has still been around. But as far as the city diners are concerned, uh, we have to bring those back. And we have to find a way, find a nuance to bring those things back because that I think that's what makes Philadelphia unique. We're all known for five star restaurants, but there's nothing nothing that replaces the the classic diner uh, in Philadelphia. That's right. There's nothing like those cheap eats, and I hear you. I think there are still a lot out in Jersey, for example, kind of car country, northeast Philly. There's still some, but they're just not as right. many as they used to be. Yeah, bring them back, especially the center city. <laughs> yes, right downtown. So I still live in in New Jersey. So in mm. terms of, we still have a few. Um, my favorite one where I live is probably the White House Luncheonette in Morristown, Maple Shade, mm. right along Linola and uh, Camden Avenues. In Philly, I I I I used to love going to the Midtown, but you know, there's still the South Philly institution of the Penrose Diner. You know, with the with the giant tome of a. <laughs> Of a menu. <laughs> totally, totally. Well, glad to hear from New Jersey too. Get some representation. What about you, Abraham? I, I I'm so I'm such the wrong person to ask this because um, <laughs> as a, as an immigrant to the U.S., diners make zero sense to me. Okay. <laughs> because <laughs> what about them? I'm not sure that you should be able to offer every food item in the world in one menu. <laughs> it's too um, American for you. It, it's a lot to read. Um, but I guess they call themselves a diner, kind of diner coffee shop, Morning Glory in um, Tencent Fitzwater mm. is a favorite. Also, places that are nice to little kids, uh, always always a plus and across the street from a playground. So, yeah, I'll go with Morning Glory. Yeah. Well, let's get into some news this week. A lot of highs, a lot of lows. Um, Marco, we're going to start with you. So there was a report released by the Philadelphia Department of Public Health that compiled the newest statistics about drug overdose deaths in Philly. This was for the year 2022. What did they find? Unfortunately, what they found was it's still a problem, and it it is claiming more and more lives. Um, Over 1,400 people died of overdoses in 2022. It was an 11% increase from 2021. The numbers Mm. that stood out to us at the Tribune were among African Americans, a 20% increase from last year, an 87% increase from 2018, from really, I guess, when things really started to get people's attention. Also, a couple of things that really stood out to me during in going over it was that the age of victims is actually going up. It's now started out at the average age was 43 and a half in 2018. It's increased to 48 in 2022. And the median age among African-American men, which is the largest group, is 55. Yeah, that sounds really alarming. And can you, can you tell us what drugs are causing 
that's in our city? Is it is it a single drug? Is it a certain cocktails that, that are fatal? How are people dying of, of overdoses? Well, according to the report, um, it's a lot of it is fentanyl, but they're seeing an increased amount of people dying, especially African Americans dying of combinations of opioids and stimulants. So more, I guess, cocaine and and stuff mix mix with the fentanyl. Mm. You know, you mentioned that the demographics of of who's being affected by by overdoses has changed a little bit. It's older. It's more African American city residents. And I know that we often think about the opioid epidemic as really being centered in the Kensington neighborhood. But is that an accurate picture of of where people are dying, where people need help, or or is there more to the story? So the Kensington area is still the zip code. The 19134 still has the most deaths. I, I think it was like it was like 175 or so. But more deaths are happening along North Broad Street. And more are also happening in West Philly. That is that is market mostly north and a little bit south along where the L runs. So, you know, these are these are neighborhoods that have probably that have seen a lot over the years, especially during during the crack epidemic, especially in West Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Did the city share any plans they have for making sure next year isn't a record breaking number in Philly in terms of overdose deaths? So that's gonna be really interesting to see down the road. They've they've talked about you know con, con, convening panels to discuss things. They're discussed. They're bringing up more outreach programs, going door to door in neighborhoods to to reach out to residents. They want everyone carrying naloxone, so that way, if they were to encounter someone struggling, you know, potentially overdosing, you can you can reverse it. I think it's just getting more people aware getting more people invested. We're going to move on to another health-related story now. Big news this week. Two scientists from the University of Pennsylvania won a Nobel Prize. Huge deal, obviously. Abraham, can you tell me what they won it for? Yeah, uh, big, big uh, news to Philly and, you know, um, among awards and um, championships and stuff we hope to bring this year. Uh, the science had their own. Um, so on Monday, the Nobel Committee in Sweden announced that Kataline Kerikou and Drew Weissman, true pen scientists who developed the technology that was the basis for the mRNA vaccines against the coronavirus, uh, won the Nobel Prize in Medicine and Physiology. And it's truly an incredible achievement. And uh, yeah, I think the fact that we kind of know to use the term mRNA is a testament to how much change in the world in the last two years, three years, and right. how much this invention shaped, you know, our lives. Absolutely. And you did some really interesting follow-up reporting. So everyone was talking about this announcement, you know, these scientists getting recognition for this huge contribution they made. But you actually looked into how much money Penn made off the vaccine research. And I just want to know, what did you find? Yeah, it, it, it's it's a fascinating story, I think, because of many different reasons. But um, so Penn, Kirikou and Weissman did not make the vaccines. Okay. They created a technology. This kind of was an idea that Kirikou had years and years ago. She's like, what if we take kind of the blueprint that teaches the body how to do stuff? Mm -hmm. Pieces That's of genes MR or mRNA? Okay. The mRNA. Mm -hmm. And what if we basically send it small scripts that can teach the body to do things we want it to do and then use the immune so system itself. It is so sci-fi. And that's how people took it at the times so when people didn't give her funding and she mm. was demoted because of it and she uh, didn't get tenure track. And it's kind of incredible because kind of fast forward in 2005, Kariko and Weissman have this paper that talks about how um, you know, all the applications that potentially could be for mRNA. And they talked about genetic diseases uh, and cancer. Mm. And they get into this relationship with these companies that actually create products for consumers, for market health products. Mm -hmm. And suddenly 2020 comes along. There are companies sitting on this technology and working on it, trying to find the application, the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And now suddenly you have 
a novel virus and a rush for a vaccine in the entire world. Mm. And those companies also had exclusivity on a patent. And okay. So now when you have every government in the world starting to buy tons and tons of vaccines that they did in record speed, a lot of money comes in. The numbers are bigger than my brain can comprehend. Uh, so I think Pfizer's income was it's in the, it's in the 30 billions a year. Um, it's, it's, it's a lot of money uh, mm-hmm. only from the vaccine. Uh, and Penn has a cut. It's their, it's their patent. Um, it doesn't go directly to them, but if people are interested, they can read the piece in the Inquirer. Mm-hmm. And overall, we estimated that they got in 2021 and 2022 $1.7 billion with a B uh, in revenues from licensing these vaccines. But really important to say, this is an estimate for okay. many reasons, based on a confidentiality clause in this agreement, Penn cannot tell us. So we use public sources, we use public databases of disclosures of payment, and we use investor documents to try to say, what is the ballpark here? Mm-hmm. Um, but we feel pretty confident that the number is quite large. That's a ton of money. And it's you were talking about how the the researchers, the, the you know people who came up with the kernel of this idea you know, kind of struggled for funding for a long time. So are they seeing any of this windfall? It's a good question. Uh, so again, I, I don't I don't know. Uh, there's two things that we can kind of get an idea. So this money, because part of this research is funded by um, federal uh, funding. So when you get, as a university, when you get mm-hmm. revenue from licensing of something that was funded originally by government funding, like NIH grants and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're governed by this 1980 law that has limitations on how you can use the money. And the law also says that you have to give some of it to the investors. And this is kind of more complicated. And because of that, uh, I didn't feel comfortable that I can back up an envelope and uh, figure that out. Okay. But uh, not to cross to editorial lines, but hopefully they made some money. <laughs> yeah, they got the Nobel, which is also pretty cool. That's pretty cool. But more than a billion dollars is a lot of money. What is this money going to go for now? I mean, Penn is already just such an established research institution. Do they need this money or or is it going to further some of their research goals? So Penn, again, because of that law, there is also limitations on how the money can be used. So the money needs to go back to fund science. That's kind of, I think, the the bargain the government is doing here. We will fund your science. Then you will go out and maybe make some money of it by patenting this, by doing relationship with companies. But what you get back, you will bring back to science. Whether or not this, you know, what Penn does with their overall budget is for Penn and not for me. And people's opinions about that is for them and not for me. But they have already outlined $750 million in investments in uh, basic science and some of the most cutting edge research, including uh, things like cell and gene therapy, which mm. is, again, talk about sci-fi, uh, taking uh, kids with um, sickle cell um, mm-hmm. and literally changing the way their body creates red blood cells to be wow. in the right. Like it's, it's, it's incredible uh, stuff. It's stuff that also gets patented and also brings revenue to Penn. Um, but they outlined this really ambitious uh, expansion uh, of uh, already big and ambitious scientific blueprint that include $350 million into new laboratory space. Super interesting. Yeah, just the way I really appreciated your reporting and the way you brought together, you know, this sort of world-changing scientific discovery and a little exploration of the business of medicine that makes it happen. So thank you for that. Appreciate it. Before we get out of here, we have to talk about the Phillies, though. We can't can't leave it out. It's been a really exciting week in sports news. OJ, we, we got to get into this. So the Phillies won their second game against the Miami Marlins on Wednesday night. They crushed this wild card series. What was your favorite moment? What were your highlights from this week? Well, I know everybody's going to say uh, the Bryson Stott Grand Slam. The Grand Slam was dope. In, it was in amazing. Game two. Um, but my favorite part is just the whole entire home field advantage that Philadelphia gives. And, and it's on a grand stage, not only for all of Major League Baseball, but for the whole country, all the sports. And the home field advantage that we have here in Philly is uh, so overwhelming to not only the opponents, but it's overwhelming to opposing fans who come here, who come to support their other team. And once they step foot in Citizens Bank Park, the atmosphere is just overwhelming. It was loud. It yeah. was, you could hear it on the TV. It was just like a roar. 
every time. It was amazing. And that brings me to the uh, Bryson Stock Grand Slam because there's a video going around where they're just playing the sounds. No announcers, <laughs> nothing. You just hear the, the crack of the bat. And then you just hear the sound of the 45,000 fans. And that's just the epitome of what it is to be a Philly sports fan. But, you know, we do have to talk about Bryson Stott's Grand Slam. We already, we probably knew that the Phillies were going to pull off the game and win it maybe, you know, three to nothing or three to one. It ended up being seven to one, right? But that was just a perfect exclamation mark to just close out the Miami Marlins, close out the series and say, hey, we're that much better than you. You have no chance. We're going to move on to Atlanta. Yeah, so tell us what comes next. We're going to face the Braves, right? What can we look forward to? Abraham's shaking his head. Uh (laughs) (laughs) Uh-oh. Well, as we say, with, with Miami being a division rival, we're talking about the Atlanta Braves being the arch rival. And these are arguably the two best teams in the National League. You can add the Dodgers in there as well. But these are two teams that know each other. They probably have the two best uh, lineups as far as batting is concerned uh, in the National League. So it's going to be a heavyweight fight. And Mm -hmm. the Atlanta Braves, they're going to look for revenge. So as we know from last season, the Phillies knocked out the Braves in the division round. So I know there's going to be uh, a lot of animosity uh, coming from uh, the Braves themselves. But I think the caveat that, you know, we have to understand here is that I believe the Phillies are better than they were last year. Okay. Because the addition of Trey Turner, uh, the young guys being even better. We talked about Stott, also mm-hmm. Alec Bohm. Uh, becoming an even better major league player, both offensively and defensively. Uh, They have the young guys in the outfield with uh, Rojas, Pache, Bryce Harper now playing every day at first base. He's healthy. Mm -hmm. Uh, So that's that's a a big sign. And who knows? We may we we all know what uh, Kyle Schwarber can do as well. But who knows? These Hoskins. It's war bomb. Exactly. They're naming sandwiches and drinks after every year. So (laughs) but but I just think this team is built to win. Uh, they're built to win now, and I think they have just as good as a good a chance to beat the Braves this year as they did last year. But it's going to be fun to watch. And again, once you get to games three and four here at Citizens mm. Bank Park, I don't think any opponents are ready for that atmosphere. It's going to be fun. Any predictions or any playoff rituals? And I could ask this to anyone. Well, I, I think... I think the Phillies can win um, because the one thing with the Atlanta Braves, uh, they are ailing uh, with their starting pitching staff. Uh, Mm, They have one guy who's out. Um, They have another uh, who uh, has a rehab start, but they may not be 100 percent pitching wise. So if the Phillies can kind of keep Atlanta's bets to, uh, I want to say a bare minimum, to a reasonable minimum, they have a great chance of winning. But I think the Phillies can win in, in four games. We will take it. We'll take that positive thinking. We'll take whatever we can get. OJ Spivey, sports and culture writer for the Philadelphia Tribune. Thank you so much for coming back on and talking about the Phils. Thank you, Laura. Always a pleasure. And Marco Serino from the Philadelphia Tribune. Thank you for sharing your reporting as well. Always my pleasure. And Abraham Gutman, health reporter at the Philadelphia Inquirer. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Phillies in three. To read the stories that we talked about today, check out the links in our show notes. It's time for the tip of the week, where we share a life hack for living in Philly. The city offers virtual overdose prevention and reversal training for free. This one and a half hour lesson gives background on opioid use and how to use Narcan in response to an opioid related overdose. To sign up for the next course, which is on October 18th at 5.30, and for more on overdose prevention tips, visit the link in our show notes. If you have a tip of the week, we'd love to hear from you. Call or text us at 215-259-8170. That's all for today here on CityCast Philly. Our host is Trine Nuree. Our producers are Abby Fritz and Elizabeth Kama. Our Hey Philly newsletter editors are Brittany Valentine, Adrian Gonzalez, Brian Vance, Will Fulton, and Natalia Aldana. Our lead producer is me, Laura Benchoff. Music is by Philly's own Interminable, with additional music from All the Kimonos and James Weldon. 
If you enjoyed the show, why not tell a friend? Leave us a review, rate us, and subscribe to our morning newsletter, Hey Philly. We're taking Monday off, but we'll be back Tuesday morning with more news from around the city. Have a great weekend and be safe. Bye. I, I, I remember the Phillies Braves LCS in 93. I remember game five during my ninth birthday party on Columbus Day when my dad's Aww. went back and forth to the car because it was much harder to find out what was going on back then. <laughs> so he could listen to the thing. radio? Aww. Yeah, yeah. He would, he would like run, run out to the car while, while we were all bowling. I 